Welcome to another edition of All About the Grace. I'm Bridget Ayer and I'm here with my guest Leighton Drake. We're going to do a part two. Um, Leighton is the Director of Faith Formation at Our Lady of Mount Carmel and he's also, and what we're going to talk about now is um, you're a Catholic artist and I, I call you an evangelist because you use your art to, yeah. to kind of evangelize and talk about God. But your ministry is called Drawn to Life Ministries. Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to talk about how you have you been an artist your whole life, or did mm -hmm. God just infuse this this no, gift no. in you? So talk talk about your um your art, and then how you kind of combined your artist skills with evangelization. Okay. And then what you do. Okay. You know. Um, well, I, ask, I always ask like yeah. five questions. No, that's <laughs> that's like a press that's, conference. Well, that's okay because I answer like twenty. <laughs> that's good. Um, and no. I don't have to talk anymore yeah. because Layton is just going to talk yeah, the whole rest of the time. And that's go, cool. I'll drink, you need to do, drink, I'll just... go, go do some laundry or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I started drawing. Uh, my mom used to tell me that I started drawing when I was about five. That she noticed I was. I still have some of the drawings from kindergarten. Actually. Are they really good? No, not really. But I mean, they're, <laughs> they're probably, probably better than mine. I probably can't better draw. than most five-year-olds. Okay. You know, I started to have like a. You know, there was a. a you were interested. I was in starting it. to show talent, I guess. Okay. But that um, never happened. With yeah. Me. But, yeah. No. It was. It was a. I. I, I couldn't sell them today. Okay. And uh, well, no, maybe but, you could though. You know. Yeah. Right. Famous yeah, now. You know? yeah. 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 Um, I but, think you're famous. Well, you're famous in my yeah. book. Oh, my holy you. book of famous guys. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so we're gonna start. We're gonna start. <laughs> um, well, so I I love to draw, and honestly, I was uh, I loved cartooning. Uh, that okay. was my favorite thing. I went through a phase where I wanted to be a comic book artist okay. and writer. I love to write. And um, and then I went through a phase where I was really into the far side, Gary Larson's oh, the far yeah. side. Oh, yeah. And I was formed on the far side. Well, look, I've got one right there on the refrigerator. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, was, he was probably my favorite. I didn't think he was the greatest artist. I don't know that he would even think so, but he was he was a brilliant, brilliant Oh, yeah. Uh, he's, sitting on he's, a, he's sitting on one of those islands, you know, where yeah. everybody... <laughs> yeah, he's, he's brilliant. But... So I was really, um, I was really into that for a long time, and so as a young man, when I went through my conversion experience, when I was um, like 26 through 28, um, that period of coming to the church, um, I was doing illustrations. I worked for a, an art company. It was a miserable job. I hated it, and in this little cubicle, and I, uh, I always enjoyed drawing very much. But as I when, when I became Catholic, evangelization became my passion. I and can so, relate. Yeah, so it was almost like art was only good insofar as I could use it for my... Now, I still enjoy, like, I, I love to write and I love to draw cartoons and fun things. I still enjoy it very much, but my true passion became evangelization, so I started praying. That's why, that's why I hit it off with you when I first met you, because I'm like, yep, he gets sure. it, I'm totally into that, and he's totally <laughs> into that, and let's go get him. <laughs> Let's, we're going to go get you. We're getting you right now, you know? So same, same with media for me, you know, just wanted to... To use it. To use it. Yeah, it. yeah it's, you know, I, I remember, I, I might get wrong, there's all this Mr. Rogers stuff out now that, you know, with the movie, Tom Hanks movie come, yeah. was coming out, and they did a documentary that I still haven't seen that I want to see. Mr. Rogers is kind of one of my heroes. Yeah. And the reason why is because I remember reading an article about him many years ago, and I remember that he talked about how... He, he wanted so badly to help young people, mm -hmm. and he saw, and he, he went to seminary and, and all that, but he saw TV as a medium to get his message across, and of course he was working in public television, so there were certain things, boundaries he couldn't go across or sure. board. But, but I always really respected that, that he used something that he was passionate about and good at to um, to serve the greater purpose, and so I started praying. That's what we're doing here. Yeah, exactly, and I, I said, <clears throat> Lord, how can I use my art in a way to serve you? And I think he has done so in a modest way with Drawn to Life. We're, it's a very modest ministry. We go, we've done, um, you know, I've done parish missions, uh, retreats, and that sort of thing. I use it a lot in my, in my ministry, at my parish ministry, you know, my full-time parish yeah, ministry. Yeah, and I want to I wanna get up and um, actually we're going to have some of our, our videographer go over there and grab one of those flyers off of there. Yeah. Our videographer <laughs> out there. <laughs> Grab one of those flyers over there off the wall. Look, look up, look up. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So Leighton was talking about how he uses this in his ministry, and my children actually happen to be in his ministry, and this is actually taped up. So this is just kind of an example. Yeah. In fact, I'll just do like that. 
Isn't that really cool? So that's what I love to do. Yeah, yes. That's my favorite thing. Um, my I'm, videographer can put it back up. There's so we have a whole staff. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. But I get some food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, uh, <laughs> no, I, so I, that's really, and, and honestly, the truth is that um, I don't consider myself a fine artist by any stretch. Um, I do do, I do realistic depictions of Christ and things like that for talks. Um, but my real love is cartooning. And so I use cartooning a lot, like in PowerPoint presentations and that sort of thing. And It's really, I mean, I've, I guess I've, I have seen, you know, yeah. some of your work just because I have two, um, two of my younger kids are, um, have gone through your program. One's still in there right now. Mm -hmm. But just, I just love seeing all the things that you're doing. And then when you do like VBS, yeah. you do the same. I can use and the, yeah, so there's... Again, so I, I also I, I play guitar and I'm That's not, true, you do. not that great at it, but I can lead <laughs> praise and worship either. for young people. Right. And so again, I never had this ambition. Well, I did when I was in high school. I wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> Every high school My guy dad has said, ambition. If you want to be a rock star, don't you think you should play an instrument and <laughs> sing? And I was like, oh yeah. Yeah, it's kind so, of it's kind of a uh, prerequisite. Yeah, that's too right? much work. <laughs> so I just wanted. So, but but. I see those things as ways that I can, they're, they're ways that I can um, serve the ministry. And so with, I love working with young people because I think they're, they have so much joy and potential for joy. They're so open. Um, and, and I, I, I just feel like that there's so much going against them. I tell parents in ministry all the time. Are I'll you say, looking at my questions over here? No, no, I swear. <laughs> I'm just, my eyes wander. That's okay. So, it's okay. I'm like, he's looking at my questions. Handle. So, and <laughs> we burn the place down. What flavor this is? So uh, I, it's like coconut or something. It smells good. Yeah. You can yeah. smell that, <laughs> man. Yeah. So he has extra sensory perception it's a too. Um, <laughs> you forgot your cape. We could do a whole segment. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, so, and that's what our whole next retreat is. Yeah. For kids. So, but the thing is that um, I I see um, I think that um, that I tell parents I'll say. If we you don't are looking at my questions. No, I swear I wasn't. This is good. This is the oh, Holy Spirit, right? But Go ahead. I tell parents, I say, if if uh, if you don't evangelize and catechize your children, the culture is going to do it for you. Now they're going to do it anyway. Right, right. We can't help unless we live in a little bubble. We cannot help, and so I always because we're parents, swimming in our culture. We're we are, and we're in. all influenced by it. Yep. All you know, of us. a lot of us in the Catholic faith. A lot of us. I've read some beautiful stuff by priests that have talked about how so many of us fall into this semi-Pelagianism and we kind What's of What's that? Well, so we see, and I'm not an expert on this, but it's basically... I know it's, nothing about it's it. It's this so idea, this yeah, I just opened this door and I have to come through. <laughs> I have to walk through this door. No, so it's this idea that it's What's based on word? ancient semi-Pelagianism. Semi-Pelagianism. It's, it's ba okay. based on an ancient heresy, but in its, in, its, in its modern form, I think I would say, I mean, I know I would say, but I think that I could accurately say that there's this idea that I kind of see Jesus as my model. And I can mm -hmm. love Jesus and see him as my model, but I'm really working my way to heaven. I'm kind of, and so the thing is that, so, you know, if I do this every day, if I do this devotion and I do this, this idea that I basically, it's a trap that I fall into that I think, oh, I'm going to get into heaven by doing these things. Like now, we're earning, not grace. Yes, not living in relationship. Okay. And so, like, if if I'm in a relationship, there are things I need to do for that to be a healthy relationship, and that's that's more true to what I see as a Catholic. I love the spirituality of Saint Therese of Lisieux. I'm becoming more. I'm by no means an expert on her, but I've been reading more and more Saint Therese of Lisieux, and this idea that I almost think of it as like the child reaching up to the. You know, she was she she saw an elevator when she was young. She went to this really fine hotel growing up, and she loved, She thought it was fascinating. The elevator was new, and so, so she saw this, and she had this idea of Jesus, you know, taking her up into the arms of the Father. And I'm kind of mm -hmm. paraphrasing, but this idea that we, it's in that relationship that we're lifted up into the arms of the Father. So it's like, it's not something I earn, and my whole point was, I don't know what my whole point was. My whole <laughs> point, I think, was that... We're so influenced by culture, and so like even me growing up, my father was very much a self-made man. We didn't go to church because that was for weak people, because you stand on your own two feet, you make it happen. That mm -hmm. was his favorite, for, he'd say that all the time, like it, he'd do motivational speaking, <laughs> make it happen. And so he, he was a wonderful uh, speaker. And so, but he would say, make it happen, and, and this idea that I, I do it on my own, I don't need anybody else. 
And so even in my walk with the Lord, I've really, I am so formed by that, that it's a trap I fall into. And that's why I love St. Therese of Lisieux. And that's why I love scriptures that talk about the love of the Father. And that, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. it's like this idea that in relationship with Christ, He leads me into the arms of the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's like this, it's this beautiful uh, encounter with the Lord that lifts me up. And But we're constantly, constantly come out by our culture and so and our kids today i mean with with their access to social media and, and all this stuff going on you know the the technology that we didn't have when we were growing up, i didn't it, it really changes the dynamic i mean substantially and I, I think that um so what can parents do do you have like should we do layton's top 10 oh tips we could do another segment on that layton's top 10 tips of what 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 can parents do to pass on the faith that that is one of my questions from the perspective of a youth minister who's been in this yeah. for a while what are parents doing right and what are parents what can parents do better yeah I mean you know what I mean and we even talked about this before we got started that you might have parents in three different categories you know because you might have parents that are really devout Catholics that are really trying to pass on the faith mm-hmm. then you have ca- parents that are Catholic that maybe haven't maybe had a conversion experience but they have they're I guess living their Catholic faith to the best of their ability but maybe they haven't had like a lock stock and barrel yeah. <laughs> conversion I don't know if that's yeah. a good analogy and then you've parents that maybe go to church but really it's kind of a very marginal part of their life you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. so how do you is there advice you can give to all parents, no matter where they're at, I guess. I, th- I think so. I think honestly, and I'll be in all true, true sincerity. That's what we like. Things here. that I've learned. <laughs> all yeah. true sincerity. All right. I haven't <laughs> been sincere until now. Now I'm <laughs> sincere. No. Yeah, me and all, No, it's but, all been fake news prior to that. Yeah, you know? fake, yeah. We, just, we faked it all. Oh my gosh. No, I. <laughs> <laughs> but it's through my failures. So I've got five kids, and um, from uh, adult down to six years old. And the thing is that I've learned through a lot of failure, a lot of failure. And I think today, um, as I get older and, and um, more, you know, I've had my teeth kicked in a few times, um, I really believe the first thing I say is to be a person of prayer. That, and it sounds so trite and so obvious, mm-hmm. but the reality is I know from my own experiences that if you let go of that, if you let your heart wander or grow cold, and I think prayer helps me as a as a parent to stay in the game with God and I have a friend in Phoenix he's a diocesan uh, he, he directs a um, prison ministry and he'll say he'll say brother he says every morning I got to get up and I say Jesus I need a savior I need a savior today because the thing is that left to my own devices I will go out there I mean that's just you know it's just a fact and so I have to stay rooted in prayer I've learned that from experience and I have to I have to love the Lord and so I have to do and love isn't always it's not always a great feeling sometimes love is just showing up and doing the deal you know it's like coming home and after the dinner it's saying I'm gonna do the dishes tonight because that's the right thing to do it's doing the next right thing I'm gonna do the dishes tonight I don't feel like it but that's what love looks like right and 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 there's a whole whole kind of notion about doing things because of feelings and you know love is not about feelings and I think that's such a big mistake in our culture that's going on is that well if I feel like it will yeah if I feel like it I will or not feel like it I won't go to work today yeah so if you if you use that same analogy yeah with love okay well I don't want to change that poopy diaper or I don't want to we're and again it gets back to the culture we're so formed by the culture all I think all of us are and we it's so easy to forget what authentic love is and so go ahead and define it then. well we, we, we it's that it's that idea that uh, of being gift of self to the other for the good of the other and and the thing is that our culture does say it's a feeling it's emotional it's whatever feels good to me and and that's not always I mean the culture has some some right ideas too I don't want to like demonize the culture so much but all the good we know comes from God right so anything we find in it is comes from God and this idea of, of love is self gift and so but it's so contrary to so much that we see in films and, and, and through music and everything but the thing is that 
I think as as parents, if if we are if we don't love the Lord by our actions, I a priest, a very holy um, elderly priest, recently gave a homily, um, and he said it was. And I, I've probably said this before in different ways, and but I'll tell the young people all the time. I'll say Jesus Christ every morning is asking me, "Who do you say that I am?" And the answer that I give him is going to have it's going to make all the difference in my life. And I know for again from my painful experience that if I don't answer, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, and I need you. I'm in trouble. And so he asked me every day, and 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 uh, the priest said, he said. You answer that question that he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am, Uh by how you live your life. And that was such a powerful thing to me, that just to hear that and remember that it's so true, it's to do the next right thing. And because I know, again, from experience, when I haven't, when I've been selfish, and it's just caused all kinds of pain in my life and others that I regret deeply. And the Lord wants to give us this fullness of life and, um, you know, I had it on my t-shirt, a, a retreat t-shirt. Yesterday I had to go pick up my car at this place. And this guy comes up to me and says, I love what you're, because it said on the back, abundance of life. And it was from John 10.10, 10, you know, I came that they might have life in abundance. And we all long for that, but we just get disordered. You know, we have this, and we lose, we, I always tell the young people that, Sin is really about disintegration. It's, yes. You know, we're about integrate. We, yeah. God is all unity. about communion. Unity. Yes. Yeah. And so we, we get off track and we disintegrate through our sins to varying degrees. And then I think when I hear that word, and it's really true, you know, like I, 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 can, I can visualize like maybe a race car just crashing into a wall and just kind of go. Yeah. Or like, you know, a meteor, like one of those Star yeah. Wars. You, know, you, you blast it and then it's like. A it's, train going off the tracks and just. And it's and really, I mean, if you think of, think of you see people's lives and you know maybe different times in our own life where we went off the rails or we were disintegrated. Yeah. I mean, it really yeah. and you know by the grace of God, you know, you're able to to pull it back together. It, he it, he brings you back together. But it's really fascinating that analogy because that's really what happens. You you come unglued basically I love that you That's know it's, it's, too. it's you know you come unglued you're not who you are yeah and it's you can't function yeah. as you're supposed to it, which is exactly if you read in the revised standard version of the of the uh, the prodigal son story uh, I love it because it's more of a literal translation it says he came to himself the young man when he you know he has this conversion experience where he realizes it's the beginning of this conversion experience that if he goes back to his father you know that that he's he wants to go home, mm-hmm. and it says he came to himself. Whereas other translations say he came to his senses, which I think is a I'm not a scholar on it, but I've read scholars, and I think that he came to himself is a much better because it's talking about that integrity. It's coming. It's you know coming back together. That yeah. communion. That's really that's a that's a really interesting nuance that you it, notice it's, that it's so true. And when you experience that, that's why when we hear the story of the prodigal son, it resonates so deeply with us. So the idea that, so getting back to the parent thing, I would mm-hmm. say that prayer, staying close to the Lord, you know, reading our scriptures, but that, that to me is part of the prayer uh, piece. Um, but it's constantly coming back. I used to work with uh, young people in, in prison and in, in Phoenix. Yeah, in Phoenix. I used to work with young people with prison in prison. And we used to meet, it was at the county jail, and we would meet, and these are guys from 14, I think it was, to 18. On the night of their 18th birthday, they were taken into the adult population. It was terrifying. Oh. And these young men, uh, we would go into this. We had the, it was called the day room in the county jail, and it was the most cold. It was just white brick, and it was I think metal tables, if I remember correctly. And we would go in there, but these young men, I, I would tease with my my high school student, or at the time, I'd say. These young men are more on fire than, you know, like when we do praise and worship and stuff. And when we get up and, and preach the gospel to them, they were locked in. They were sitting forward and their eyes were locked in. They'd have tears in their eyes because they, in the day room, it was a safe place because they had to be really careful on the outside, you know, in their pods and everything. But in the day room, they could be real and they knew I need Jesus. And so we were able to reach them at a level. And so I think all of us as parents we have to know where our day room is. We all have struggles. I believe we all have struggles. You know, there's different things, things that trip us up sin-wise mm-hmm. or brokennesses. Or we hear the voices from our past. You know, a lot of times I hear the voice of my father 
um, God rest his soul, that, you know, sometimes I hear these voices that I think are him mm -hmm. and, and these things, you know, that maybe I'm not good enough or, you know, I'm not a success because, and those things, we have to have those places where we can meet the Lord in the day room where we can say, Lord, I am struggling with this. I'm so broken in this. I need you, Lord Jesus. I need you. My favorite prayer is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because to me, it's the most honest prayer next to the Our Father. I just think it's a beautiful, honest prayer. I'm a sinner, Lord. I need you. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And that brings us back to that day room, to that place where we can be real with God. And I think part of the problem is so many people who are, I think, disengaged from the faith, I think a lot, it's not because we're bad people. Mm -hmm. It's because we just haven't, maybe been honest with ourselves of how much we need the Lord maybe and that's why sometimes falling on our face in the weirdest way God can turn that into a great grace he brings so much good that we fall on our face even into some horrible sin because it helps us to remember my God I'm a sinner help me save me it's like the Psalms you know well if you think about I mean really all sin kind of is rooted in pride and I think when you you think you're so awesome, oh my you know, that it's, it's, and you know, especially like if you have material wealth or you have material success or you have, and that, that's why I think, you know, I was always worry about that scripture that says, you know, to whom much has been given, much is required, mm, uh, because I think, you know, it's, you know, what are we doing with what we have here? But that can also be when you do have a lot, or maybe, you know, you know, we're not, you know, we don't live in a third world country or whatever, mm -hmm. it's easier to think, well, do I really need God? I mean, it's really easy to kind of go through your life and say, unless you really have mm -hmm. some kind of, you know, situation, mm -hmm. disappointment, it could even just be a job loss. Oh, yes, God, sure. you know, why did I lose that it job? It could be a really? child wandering from the faith, one of your kids wandering from the faith, and it breaks your heart, and you feel helpless, and yeah. But then, I wonder what it is that has some, that where some people will turn to God and say, I need you in these various moments, and then other people just say, well... I just need another job, or I just, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, I'll find that happiness and that fulfillment if I just change this circumstance. Yeah, or, so I, I don't know what it is, but I mean, we're all, we, we talk, we've talked before about yeah. what is it that, 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 that makes conversion. Um, so, what, I know there's a study or a statistic that I think you've talked about before, that young people are leaving the Catholic Church in maybe all churches in large numbers large and like numbers. the largest growing group is called the nuns mm -hmm. n-o-n-e-s mm -hmm. where they don't really affiliate with anything yeah um, what do you think that's attributed to and again um, in addition to prayer what can parents be doing to kind of address this concern of people disengaging Again, I think it gets back to, I don't have all the answers for you why. You don't? I, I don't. <laughs> Darn it, I, I thought have, Layton was going to give us all the answers. I have point zero zero zero. No. <laughs> I think from observing through all the years of ministry I've been doing, I think that, um, I think we live in a very, um, our culture is very, um, it's not conducive to, to living the faith, obviously. And I think we're going through a lot of struggles in that. And I think that our young people are being so formed by that culture that is really a, it's such a secular culture. It's really stripping the necessity of God. And there's another term that I use a lot when I give talks is moralistic therapeutic deism. And so if you read this moralistic term, yeah, therapeutic yeah. deism. Yeah. Okay, that. this is a new. Say I'm that three times lie. quick. Mor I can't even say moralistic that. therapeutic deism. <laughs> But it's this idea that if you really look at the words... I know there was going to be a test. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Come on, do it. No. Say it's, no. So it's, it's this idea, if you read the Moralistic studies, therapeutic, therapeutic deism. deism. Okay. Yeah, and again... Um, Did you make this up or no, is this an actual no. thing? No, I'm not smart enough. I, I just read a lot of good stuff. Okay. Um, do you actually... Everything do you I say sleep? comes from... I mean... No, I do. I, I'm getting old. I have to sleep. But... Christian Smith from um, Notre Dame, um, he wrote this study on youth uh, several years ago, and that's where we get a lot of the statistics okay. that we, and he actually just did one that was on the um, the religious life of families and their parents and okay. stuff, and it's fascinating, but um, there are others that, with him, they use that term, and I don't know, I don't remember if he coined it, he might have coined it, I don't remember, but th it's this idea that we kind of see God, it's almost like it's we see God as a therapeutic so and I see this in ministry and it's very it's it's disturbing to me and I see it unfortunately I see it at high levels 
And I have to be very careful that I don't fall in the trap. You're a high level person. No, not me. <laughs> higher, higher than I'm you. I'm much higher. I'm a worm. But I, I see it, and it's this idea that if you live the faith, you're going to be happier. Now, that's true. I believe that's true. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in Article 27, I think it is, talks about you know that happiness we're made for. But we know that's a happiness that's beyond what the world promises. I, I mean, much. And so, so it's this idea that... Um, it's that you God. I, I, there's five precepts to it, or five, okay. you know, summaries. But basically, the this short is really of it, fascinating. The short of it. Well, I think it's. I think it's so pervasive in our church and in our culture. It's this idea that there's a God and He loves me, but He's more like the. It's more the God of deism that He started everything, and you know, He's the clockmaker that started it, and then He took a powder on us. You know, it's like. Okay. <laughs> but the, but He's there if we need Him. Like if I'm if I lose my job and I pray, God loves me. He's there for me. But the way I read it is. He's not necessarily an actively engaged in my moment. It's it's very, uh, it's very much against Psalm 139 that wherever I go, whether I'm at the heights or the you know, you're always there with me. I can't flee from your spirit, Lord. It's very much against that idea. Okay. And it also it's interesting because if there's no Jesus in it. Now Jesus, it gets back to some of Pelagian, and he becomes a, 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 a model to imitate, right? So, and there's a lot more to that than than I can have time to say, but. The reality is, is but we you're kind gonna of, try. No, we no, I won't. I promise. No, 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 go ahead. No, but we see Jesus as this model to imitate. But Jesus, I tell the young people too all the time. Of course, they don't know the context, but their parents do more. But I'll say Jesus isn't some '70s hippie like peace, everybody, peace. You know, I grew up as a kid in the '70s. Like, peace, everybody. Oh, love, love, love. You know, we 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 domesticate Jesus. You know, we turn him into, we make him in our image. Right. And the thing is that that moralistic therapeutic deism is this idea that he's really becomes a therapeutic god that he's like he's like i think of him as like this divine invisible teddy bear so there's no demands made and it's all about me being happy you see what i'm saying yeah hell isn't even a possibility because god loves me so darn much he's just not gonna let that happen he's gonna and again there's a broad spectrum of what people believe but i think it's infected even our church and i think that and I'll give you a concrete example. When I used to lead, uh, when I used to um, direct the RCI program uh, in, in Arizona, when I was uh, in charge of that um, as part of my ministry, I would do interviews with the people coming in, and not one time, I would just talk to them, I'd get to know them, we'd have coffee, and I'd say, hey, so why do you think you why do you feel called to the church? And it was very interesting. Not one time did someone say, because I need salvation. Now, I wouldn't expect them to necessarily articulate it that way, yeah. but it was always therapeutic reasons. Well, my, my wife's Catholic. And, I, and those aren't bad reasons to look into the church. I'm not sure, saying sure. that. But what I'm saying is, is we have to rediscover this idea that the church is the instrument of salvation in the world and that we need him. We need the Lord. And so um, I think I don't even remember the question, but I, I, I think, don't either. I think, I told you, so 20, <laughs> uh, 20 questions. You we know. were like way off but, the tangent, but it's but great I stuff. Think, well, I think part of our ministry has to be to help our brothers and sisters. And it's always, it's very important we remember, that's one of the things I really like, that, that idea of accompaniment in the sense that we have to remember, the minute we think we've got it all together, we become Pharisees. If we think, you know, and so the idea is that I'm walking this journey with other people and I'm helping, so when I'm serving young people, and even when I give talks to their parents for uh, like sacrament preparation, uh -huh. I'm always, I always try to come back to, let's help our, each other discover that longing for God. You know, I think it was Pascal, that infinite um, abyss, I think it was, or something that, um, you know, that, that deep, that God-shaped hole, you know, uh, just to paraphrase, that the idea that we all have it, but sometimes we have to help each other discover that, long, you know, that come back to that longing that we hear about in Psalm, you know, 63. Yeah, Psalm 63 and then I think Psalm 42, that that longing that the scriptures talk about. I think we all have it in the depths of our heart, but sometimes it gets obscured by all the stuff we're packing in there trying to fill it. So how do we help people discover that longing? And then we help each other to, we point in the right direction. We say, what about this? So when we go on retreats, for instance, it's so we'll do incredible like sessions. Well, I'll have core members will uh, get up and they'll give powerful witnesses and they're beautiful. But what's interesting to me is we'll ask the young people, what was the highlight of the retreat? And very often, uh, I'd say nine out of ten times, adoration, reconciliation. You know, it's like 
it's those encounters with the living Lord Jesus Christ through these through the sacraments or adoration. I mean, they come in, they're coming, they're facing the Lord, right? They're they're encountering Him in all their rawness and their brokenness. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like we do at the Mass too, but we just don't think about it. Yeah, because there's so much going on at Mass. I mean, especially, you know, at Our Lady of Mount Carmel, it's a really big church. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to pay attention, you know, mm-hmm. because there's just a lot going on. That's why we actually try to sit towards the front so I can actually Maybe we do too. pay attention so I can't see we do too. all that's going on. Um, okay, so getting back to... We didn't really get off topic, but you just gave really long answers. <laughs> <laughs> Personal prayer. Edit, no, no, we're not going to edit anything. This is good. Um, so for parents, personal prayer. Personal you know, prayer. Stay so close. your relationship with God and yeah. personal prayer is like one. Yeah. And then and talk. what? Are, okay, how? So talk at the dinner table. Um, I have a close friend at Our Lady that... I I've not heard this. I've not heard this point, but I, I'm. It's really hear. important, and honestly, it's something. I talk a lot. I'm. I'm yeah, well, hear. I mean, you and I, gotta I have listen. a problem. I gotta with listen, that. though. But we have to listen. But it's uh, getting better at that. Recently, with with uh, my daughter, um, we had a conversation at the dinner table. All my kids were gathered around, and my family, and my wife, and my all my kids, and, and we were talking. And um, and to be honest with you, we're talking about the crisis in the church right now, and mm-hmm. we we're trying because my kids We've, are. Confused. They're very confused. Have you talked about that? Yeah, well, I don't know exactly how we talk, but they kind of know what's going on, but they haven't really asked. But, I mean, I talk about it all the time. Well, so they over here, they, they hear a lot more than, um, yeah. and I kind of explain what's going on. And I think know? it's important because it's better they hear it from us and they talk. But, so... It doesn't invalidate. The big thing that I guess that I, I guess the big point that I've tried to share is that um, scandals in the church do not invalidate God's plan of salvation Absolutely. through the Catholic Church. And I think that, you know, we go back to St. John Chrysostom, mm-hmm. however you say his name, in the third century said the, the road to hell was paved oh, yeah. with the, the skulls oh, of bishops or something like that, so that we knew that, yeah. that there was going to be scandals in the church. I mean, look at Judas, look at the apostles, they bailed, yeah. you know, at the crucifixion, they was all it, ran away. Or, yeah, and was it Chesterton that said... You know, I probably missed it. I think it was just, you know, about that um, it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It just has, has not been tried or something, you know. It's just, I don't know that one, but, but yeah. A, so a, it's so, so I, guess that's, I guess that's the point that I've tried to yeah. iterate to my kids. That, and, and there's always going to be scandals and people not living up to the truth doesn't invalidate the truth. But it is a little different. It is difficult when you have a hierarchy and people get confused with, you know, what's infallibility. That doesn't oh, mean sure. people can't sin and all sure, that kind of sure. stuff. So it, it kind of gets all muddled again. Well, we but, can, but like talk, Peter, talk. we can get distracted by the you? storm. Not me. I never Not me. Like Peter, we get distracted from the sto- by the storm and take our eyes off the Lord. Mm-hmm. There are very good and holy priests and bishops, no doubt about it. But we get distracted. Not, not to say these things don't need to be addressed. But my point was really is we'll talk about these things. That, that we're a very passionate family, so we laugh because we we sometimes we talk over each other and we get very oh, we, passionate. We it's hysterical. We have hysterical. To yell to be it's heard. like on Sunday afternoons. It's crazy. I mean, <laughs> and so if people came to our house, they'd be like, wow. And so, but the thing is, we, we try to talk about these things, and it's not just the scandal. My whole point was, it's, just, it's important to talk about our faith. So one of the questions I said, you know, do you need to talk about this? I said this to one of my daughters, because she's been kind of quiet about it, and I, but I know she's hearing things, because she's older, she's a teenager, and I'm like, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And she has some beautiful thoughts, but the thing is that we have to talk about faith with all the, you know, gay quote-unquote marriage issues and all these things yeah we have to be able to and so i think as parents and i think a lot of times it's intimidating to parents because we think i don't have all the answers and it's okay to be honest with our kids and say i don't have all the answers i know jesus has the answers but we have resources as catholics we have the catechism we have so many resources now yeah we really do have a lot of resources yeah but it's if we don't talk about the, the faith and, and I'm not even just talking about issues. We, we also want to talk about what do we believe. Yeah. You know, and so I think, like, like Jesus, talking about the Lord Jesus. Like, talk, I had occasion with my little kids the other day. We were just talking, and they were asking some beautiful questions about, about God. And, but to just talk about God as someone I know. Like, I'm talking about someone who's very important in my life. 
to be able Someone to talk that you about it. are in relationship. In relationship, because that's, yeah. Because I think you can be Catholic and kind of miss, and I, I know until I had my conversion, God was just distant. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I, mean, I just yeah. felt like, I mean, he was, of course, I mean, I went to Catholic grade school and, and high school and all that, and I always went to Mass. I mean, pretty much always went to Mass, but it, and, but I just was this distant relationship. Mm -hmm. I didn't have like that personal relationship. And um, so then when I did, a lot of people thought that were, because I was friends with people that were not Catholic as well, that were Catholic Christian or non-Catholic Christians. And they thought, oh, I'll give her six months, she'll be out of the church. Uh -huh. And that kind of bothered me. I think it was almost that challenge that kept me Catholic mm -hmm. in a way, which I know that's kind of a bizarre thing, but I thought, the Lord not, can work with that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but yeah, it's just I think having that relationship and 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 praying and and, and being real. Mm -hmm. You know, being real with God and telling your kids that I mean, my, we pray all the time, you know. God is God. Do something. That's my prayer. Do something. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. You know, thing. And it's pretty simple. Cuz you're you're Help. witnessing relationship. There's a, a Abraham Heschel. Is that number 3? Yeah, it's to witnessing, talk. Okay, talk. Talk about witnessing relationship. Yeah. Is that number three? Um, yeah. We will make like that, that number three. Yeah. That'll so how do you do that? Bridge and Leighton list. Um, <laughs> so witnessing we'll, relationship. We'll have like a we'll have the thing. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. You can Seriously. Put on that, you can put on the thing. Yeah. I I think encouraging questions. So again, in youth ministry, in catechesis in general, what we do is we do this in RCI a lot of times. I see this in the churches is we come in and I'm going to give you all that we believe as Catholics. I'm going to teach you what we have to honor people or that we have to encourage their question. What do you seek for? What do you What do you want? Like in bab when I would teach baptism classes, I am really bad at that. I, I mean, I am super bad I, at that. I have been because I, I, I want to, I'm like, if you know everything we believe, you'll fall in love with God in the church. But the thing is we have to encourage people like, Let's let's help them see. There's those questions in them. Right. Abraham Heschel, the the uh, the uh, Jewish scholar, he said. Uh, Rabbi Heschel said uh, something. He said uh, he said something like, "You're closer to God when you're asking questions than when you think you have all the answers." Now, having answers is very important. That's a beautiful part of our faith. When the Catechism came out, I had just, I mean, it came out right before I became Catholic. Okay. I ate it up as a Catholic. When, yeah. it, when the English edition came, I was so excited. Yeah, it and is I pretty nice. And I still love it. Yeah. I'm, it's such I a gift I've got like about five of them. They're all oh, over me the too. place. Oh, me too. Like, and like, it's like such a gift. Where's Catechism? It's there, right over there. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's, it's beautiful we have that. But the thing is, we have to encourage our kids to ask questions. So like asking the questions like, why do you think... I mean, and, and I'm just thinking on my, you know. This is off the top of your head. That's yeah, okay. off the top of my we, head. We do that. Why, why do you think, you know, like there's an earthquake. Why do you think God allows things like this? I think we're scared to ask this because we're like, oh gosh, what if I cause them to have a crisis of faith? But you know what? What is the answer to These that? These are questions. What's the answer? You're going to give the answer to well, that? Then you have to have the exact answer and you have to know. <laughs> then you talk about it and you say, so what I'll I do. I want to know the answer so to that So what I'll question. do. Well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll share a lot of times. We had, we've had nights on suffering in our youth groups over mm -hmm. the years. And I'll often share the story about my mom's cancer. She was 53 years old and she got cancer. And um, it happened very suddenly. I mean, we, did, we found out. And she lived for 11 months. And she suffered terribly physically. I mean, she wasted away. Mm. And spiritually... It was very difficult. Emotionally, it was difficult for her and for us. I was very close to my mother. And she, it was 20 years ago. And um, the, the thing is, she actually was diagnosed the week of Mother Teresa's death. Oh, wow. And yeah, I think Mother Teresa died on September 5th, 1997, I think. And so my mom was in the hospital, um, had just had a seizure, and they found that the cancer had gone to her brain. And um, that's how they found, found the cancer. And so my point is I'll tell the story about that wrestling, but you know what, I don't give them, because I don't have that, like, that's something, I don't know the full story. I'm still bound by time and space. I'm still, you know, behind the veil. I, 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 or, you know, I don't see everything. And so, but what I know is I'll share my story about how I didn't come up with all the answers. And I'll tell the kids, I'll say, and this is true today too, at Christmas, I still go through the melancholy sometimes because I miss, she was a Christmas, she loved Christmas. Uh -huh. She had started going to church re regularly. She wasn't Catholic, she went to a Baptist church, but she was just a very um, beautiful, beautiful um, lover of God. 
and she loved Christmas. And so I get that the blues and I'll share that with them and I'll say, you know, but I'll tell you what, this is how I experienced God in this in this experience I encountered and I did. I encountered him very powerfully. And you know, the emotions of depression, anger, like God, how could you? She's been through so much already. My parents were divorced. How she went through that and and but then the grace that happened and the healing, spiritual healing I saw my mom go through. She didn't experience the physical healing maybe. <clears throat> but she experienced deep spiritual healing. And I know that from personal conversations we had right up to the day she died. I was with my mother when she died. I sang to her as she took her last breath. I sang the 23rd Psalm wow. to her as she died. I will treasure those moments. So I don't have all the answers, but what I can say is that I can find God in uniting our suffering to the Lord. He will bring meaning out of it. He brings good. It's like Romans 8, 28, you know, all things work for the good of those. Not all good things are easy. All things work for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And so it's like to be able to find God. So we don't have to have all the answers, but to have those conversations is so important. So it's witnessing. That gets back to the witnessing of faith in discussion, in asking questions, asking our children. Like I, I do a catechesis every week with my kids. And my I'd kids love to do that if I could get my kids to listen. Well, to I have mine, to make videos. Mine are nine for and six. That actually... I'm doing this with so nine and six. Okay, okay. They still think I know something, and so, but I'll. Uh, you brought out a lot of good stuff. Oh, uh, but well, I'll I'll just ask them questions. We always start our, our every week. We'll start it out, and I'll just you know start out with questions. We'll read a scripture for maybe for Sunday or whatever, and I'll just ask them questions because then it gets them. You know, because the questions are there, it's just sometimes they're distracted from them, they don't know they're there. Witnessing the faith, talking about the faith, not, you don't have to be a theologian, you don't have to be this brilliant, um, you just have to be someone in relationship with the Lord. And then I would say, is bone up on the faith. Read your catechism, and if, if the catechism is intimidating because you haven't been exposed to it, there's so, there is no excuse for us as Catholics now. There are book, book after book after book after book on the faith that are so accessible. Father Jacques Philippe, beautiful little books on the faith. He's a French priest and they've been uh, translated into English. Beautiful, concise, but about spirituality and faith, solid. Um, but just And there's and there's actually grow. tons of apps too. I mean Oh my gosh, yeah, I absolutely. mean you don't even have to have a book absolutely. anymore. And just, it, yeah. You know? And of course, you know, getting back to the prayer and relationship, you've got to pra you've got to go to mass. And yeah, that's yeah. something I see in our catechesis, a lot of our families, and it breaks my heart. It's not because they're not, they're not good people or they don't have good intentions. They want the best for their kids. You don't know what you don't know. Right. And if they knew, right. they would be going to Mass. Because when we go to Mass, the graces that come from that experience, and, the, and that in itself is the witness of faith. This matters. This is the most important thing that we do as Catholics. It's very true. So. Very true. I mean, I'm not even sure where we went, but man, it was really good. And um, I mean, I didn't know you were going to... You're so rich in scripture, and you have all these books that you've been reading. Because I'm a just, work in progress. I need help. So I have to read a lot, it. and I need a lot of help. <laughs> well, um, Leighton, you've been really Thank a treat. You. This has been a real surprise, a kind of a good surprise. Very passionate, right? And so we all, we all need to be passionate, right? I think so, for the right things. <laughs> Definitely. Because so, I can be passionate in the wrong ways, and, and I think that just to... To cling to the Father, cling to the Lord is, is so important for me. I've got to uh, constantly need Him. It gets back to Jesus, save me today. Be, be my Savior. I need you today. And I think just being real is what, you know, we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, you know, sometimes the culture gets get Christians mixed up like, we're so good or oh, yeah. we're so holy. I mean... I feel like we're so trying, yeah, so I like that. <laughs> but we're not so there yet, I like that. you know. And so, um, sometimes I feel like in our culture that we're very um, kind of the expectation is that we are perfect, mm -hmm. but and so that if Christians fail, it's kind of worse than if you're not a Christian yeah. and you fail. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's kind of like a double standard or something. Oh yeah, it's really difficult. So, but we're all the same. We're just trying. So. I like that. I'm, I'm not so holy. I'm so trying. <laughs> anyway, to be holy is to be set apart for God's use. And it's like, we're all, we're all like that. The struggle is and to live up to that. Again, we can't earn God's love, but we can live in God's love. And we do that, you know, read Ephesians 5, 
at one and two, it talks about walk in love or or live in love, depending on the translation, and giving ourselves up like uh, or like Christ gave himself up as a sacrifice to God the Father. So it's like this idea that living in relationship. There is there are things we do to do that. Just like any relationship, you can't have a friendship or a marriage or anything if you're not doing certain things because what happens is your heart grows cold to it and you lose that. Same thing happens with the Lord. So there are things we have to do, and that's why I love the both end of being Catholic. That God saves us, but we participate in that. And I think, um, you know, I hope people can see that it's not as hard to be a Christian as maybe you think. You know, I think sometimes people think, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy because there's, it's always a struggle, but I think that sometimes people think, well, there's no, I've done too many bad things or I couldn't, I couldn't be a Christian, oh, I couldn't gosh, be a yeah. Catholic, and there's no way I could live like that. But honestly, I mean, I feel like my life has been so exciting. I mean, mm -hmm. there's never been a dull moment yeah. <laughs> really since I've basically given my life to Christ. Oh, yeah. It's been a blast. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've done radio, TV, now I'm doing this. I mean, just, just you, God just does. It's, it's not boring. Yeah. And it's, it's and he gives you fun. What, yeah, and he gives you what you need. You grow. It's like a child growing. A child who's six is not expected to approach life like a thirty or forty year old. I mean, the Lord is so patient and kind to us, and we just we stay in the game. We. We, you know, we stumble and we get back up. We stumble and we get back up and we learn and we learn and we learn. And life is a school of love and you, you participate in the school by participating in the school. It's when we give up on ourselves or I've got too much dark. I mean, we all could say that. So, so here's, here's the pitch. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you have a really bad past, that's okay. If you're not perfect, that's okay. If you want to be Christian or you want to renew your Christian life or renew your Catholicism, all you gotta do is go to confession, right? Absolutely. It's pretty super easy. Yeah. And um, you're not gonna be perfect after you come back. Yeah. You're gonna make mistakes, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yeah. So come back. Yeah. This is a comeback pitch, right? Yeah, yeah, come yeah. Come back to the faith. Come home. So, Leighton, you've been a great guest. Thanks, really. We've completely gotten off topic. What we are we talking about? I don't know what we're we talking about. We got from your art to all sorts of holy stuff. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ladies.